Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this Christmas Sunday, a Sunday before Christmas, Lord, and we just pray that in this season where there's so much hustle and bustle, we pray that, Lord, you just help keep our eyes fixed on the whole reason for Christmas in the first place. Mm-hmm. That's Jesus. We thank you for that gift to the world, and uh, we pray now that you would help, our, help open our eyes to see, help open our ears to hear, and open our hearts to feel Christ. Uh, this day, Lord, and we just pray that uh, we lift up those that are suffering right now. We want to lift up, lift up Steve. Uh, we want to lift up uh, 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 Stuart, Monty Stewart, Lord, as he's battling cancer right now. We yes, just Lord. pray that you'd give their body strength, that you'd surround them with love and support, Lord, and those that are hurting with them, Lord, give them support as well. Let them know that they're loved, and, uh, and we just lift them up to you right now the great physician, the one who can heal, and the one who's taken away the biggest hurt we all have, and that's sin that we needed to get paid for. So with that now, Lord, we just pray that you bless this day, bless this, this uh, Christmas week. Lord, mm-hmm. pray that you do mighty things in, in, uh, in this body today and for each person that listens. Lord, we just ask this now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to the very first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be in chapter 1, where it begins. The story of the New Testament starts off with the introduction of Jesus. Now, if you're just joining us, you come uh, every Christmas time to Hawaii, and you think I only teach one message, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> we have more than one up my sleeve. It's just that you came on Christmas Sunday for us. So, uh, But this is one of my favorite things to share is the message about our Lord, that uh, hit the gift of Jesus to the world. Now, the Gospel of Matthew was written by one of Jesus' disciples, and he was Jewish. And his um, audience that he writes to is also Jewish. So for all of you that have Jewish friends, you're wondering, how do I share things about Jesus with them? Let's start with the book of Matthew. I mean, the very first book of the New Testament is perfect, for sharing with somebody who's Jewish because it begins with a genealogy of Jesus. And you say, why a a genealogy means um, who begat who, begat who, begat means that's the old King James for, you know, the dad of this person and then the dad of that person. The one who had this kid and then had that kid, had that kid, all the way down through the generations, starting from Adam all the way to Christ. The genealogy of Jesus is the first topic of the New Testament. Now, why would, why would Matthew point out Je- Jesus' lineage? Why would he have to even go there? Does anyone know? Prophecy. prophecy, that's right. In the Jewish culture, there was prophecies given to the Jews, repeated, that said God would bring the Messiah through this Jewish lineage. But it started from Abram who got his name changed, you guys know, to Abraham, Father Abraham. And he is called the father of the faith, Abraham is. And he had Isaac, and Isaac had, you guys remember that guy's name that got changed to Israel? Jacob, that's right. And then Jacob had the the 12 sons, or Israel did. We call them the 12 tribes of Israel. And then through the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the guys that comes down the line is uh, it, 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 it comes to him to, to Judah. Then t- through Judah, comes all the way down to a guy that's kind of famous in Old Testament, King David, the shepherd boy David we studied about that became king. And then from David all the way down from through his sons all the way. This, now, the reason this is important is because God repeated his promise of a, 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 of a savior. In each of these generations, you know, it's not new news to the Jews that God is going to send a Savior. In fact, they knew it. They were already aware of it. And when, well, I'm, today I'm just going to tell you where it is. Over in Luke's Gospel, when this guy, King Herod, has um, a visitation by these wise men. Do you remember that story? The wise men come and they say, where is the one who's born King of the Jews? 
And Herod went to the religious guys and says, where does it say the king of the Jews is supposed to be born? And so the religious guys, they got out the scriptures, they read the scriptures. And what did the scripture, what town was it? You guys know the name, right? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And, and that's right, house of bread. That's what it translates to. The house, Beth in Hebrew is house, Le is of, and Hem. If you go to Israel and you need to, you don't know what to order, just say Hem. You know, that's bread. At least you're going to get some bread. You'll do all right. You know, you live. And their bread is really good, by the way. They got all these fresh baked breads, but non-GMO. And they, uh, <laughs> and, they, and they have, you know, Bethlehem, house of bread, is the place where John calls Jesus in his epistle the bread of life, which has come down out of heaven. The bread of life just cryptically, coincidentally, was born where? At the house of bread. Do you think that's a, do you think that was a riddle? I mean, talk about in your face, like, you know, <laughs> wink, God going, see, I got gotcha. you, you know. And the Lord does this all the time. He does these little winks because he was making his promise come to life for these people. By the time it gets to Matthew, Matthew's like, you wouldn't believe it. This, this what God promised, he did. In fact, in the book of, of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, there's a line that Matthew repeats over and over. He says, this, this is what the Lord did. You know, he'll tell the story. In order that the scripture might be what? Fulfilled. And then he'll talk a little bit more, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did that, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. He keeps doing it over and over. This is why, and so it's like the key that unlocks the Gospel of Matthew. You want to have fun and read the Gospel of Matthew and find out how many things did Jesus fulfill? You know, to a Jew, no, to a Jew who already knows this, these promises, to them it's, it's like a wonderful unlocking of answers that they've been waiting for. Matthew is just going, look at this one, what Jesus did. Unlock that door. Look at this one, what he did. Jesus undid this one. Jesus did this. In order that the scripture may be fulfilled. He kept doing it over and over and over. Hello. We have a, one of them paraglider things going over the top. See, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus didn't have to deal with those when he was preaching. I don't know. <laughs> Too bad we can't take the camera and aim it up there. The, uh, this has been so fun doing the YouTube because the people don't believe me on the radio. Well, that, you know, that I'm on the radio on the mainland, and, and when they hear me say there's whales, they call. There's not really whales behind you, is there? They don't know that this is our wallpaper. But I am so excited because this, this uh, YouTube thing that we're doing, the kids, they, they edit the stuff, and this morning we had whales right there. Right on the left side of the rock, and then they moved over there and jumped all the way out. And I'm like, oh boy, I can't wait to have them edit that into the, into the video so they can see th what glorious wallpaper we have. Now, I don't know about you. I am not a, I'm not one of those people, tree huggers, that, that worships nature or wor worships whales. I don't. I, I worship the maker, the creator of all these things. And it, but the, the Bible says that all of creation testifies of his glory what a great creator we have. i mean i don't know about you but i feel closer to the lord when i'm outside like this and i see his handiwork all around me it just makes me feel like man go god i mean you, you're so when i'm in a building it's kind of like looking at all the stuff man-made i found out on the mainland they actually project pictures movie pictures of our wallpaper <laughs> on their walls just to make them feel like they're here i feel they're snowed in, and they have this. I mean, I feel bad for them. <laughs> we got the real deal, you know? And we get to wear shorts, you know? They're freezing. So, so we have so much to be grateful for. Now, when we come together at this time of year and celebrate this wonderful gift of the bread of life coming to be born at the house of bread, that's a real kind of God's way of winking to the Jews. See, guys? I'm answering. I'm answering. And if you have a Jewish friend, they want to know how, how, why. See, they're taught the only way they're back. Those of you that are under the tents can't see. There's they, they're landing over there. Yeah. Come to church. 
We need to come join us, you know. You guys would crack up, wouldn't you, if the guy just came swooping down, flew in. That would be great. If only he didn't crash. Well, we have Jewish friends that are a little bit, um, they, they know the promises because it's been told to them. Look, it was told to our forefathers, to their forefathers, to their forefathers. And they, if some Gentile guy should show up and say, I'm the Savior, you know, I'm the Christ. You know what they would do, right? Poopa, no way. They will not accept a, a, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, as the Messiah because they know the promises were made. God said, through this lineage will I bring my Savior, my Son. And it was a sign to them. So they would know. When Herod had those wise men visit, and he sent the religious guy, said, go find out where is, it, where is he to be born? Who is this guy? They didn't, they didn't um, go, well, I don't know. They went right to the scriptures, came back and said, right here, you, O Bethlehem, the least amongst the clans, you're going to be the one God is going to choose to be, from the Old Testament, a little minor prophet, Micah, I believe it is 5-2, right around there. You can look it up for extra credit. How's that? Well, let me show you what, after the genealogy gets given, Matthew, I'm not going to go through the genealogy this morning. I hope you don't mind. You can read that for extra credit. This morning, I want you to jump ahead with me to verse 18, where we come to the birth of our Lord. It reads like this. It says, Now the birth of the, of the Lord of Jesus Christ was as follows. It says, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he considered this, it says, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has uh, has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place. What was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be what? Fulfilled, of course. That's good old Matthew. He says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated means God with us. Yeah, God is with us. And Joseph, it says, Joseph arose from his sleep. It's not, I'm sorry, not God is with us. God with us. It's God in the presence, God's presence with us. That's what Jesus, Emmanuel means. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife. And he kept her a virgin until the birth of of, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now when I read this part, how many of you have heard this part of the, of the scripture? This was probably one of the more visited passages in the Bible is this little portion I just read to you. Because this part, now if you're not familiar with Jewish culture, it, the beginning said that Jesus, his birth was as follows. He, his mother Mary in verse 18, was betrothed to Joseph. Betrothal in Jewish culture is different. We don't have this, uh, we, we have a thing we call engagement. You know, when you got, they got engaged, oh wow, they're engaged to be married. And um, in Jewish culture, they have engagement. But it's, let, let me just, best way I can state is it's an engagement to, on steroids. Okay, it's, um, and which by the way, I think we would do well to copy them. Let me explain why I say this, because they called it betrothal, not um, engagement. Betrothal meant promised to that person or actually pledged as husband and wife in certain ways um, with all of the responsibilities and all of the, um, how do I say to live up to this right? Say it. Uh, you get to be um, treated. The, the, the man gets to practice taking care of the woman for an entire year. Pay all of her bills. Take care of her. He doesn't get to live with her. She lives with her father under his, her father's roof. But to show his 
sincerity to take care of this girl, he pays everything it costs for her living for an entire year. And he takes care of her. He's not allowed to have sex with her in this year. This betrothal period is like kind of like a proving out period. Now, how, how would this work if we did this in America? You know? I mean, if, if you really want the girl in the Jewish culture back then, you had to, you had to man up. Basically, that's the best way I can say it. You had to like step up and say, look, I'm willing to take care of her, pay whatever it costs for her bills, do everything to show that I will be able to take care of her when she comes under my roof. And she doesn't, by the way, doesn't come under your roof until after they have the whole wedding ceremony and everything. And if you were to like sleep with them before you're married and she got pregnant, that's a huge disgrace. Now, Joseph is in the betrothal period, which means he's already paying the, what we call like a dowry. It, it, it's kind of weird. The dowry got paid up front. It was like, here, we're paying, you know, the cost of the stuff, and here, I give it to you now, and he's paying along, and I don't know how you guys would feel, but if you were doing this, you're paying for your future bride to the father-in-law, and you don't get to have sex with her, and you're, you're waiting through this whole waiting period until the coming day of the wedding. And by the way, it's always a minimum of a year. So you get a chance to really get to know your future in-laws and all of the things, you know, and they get to know you. And, and all of this goes on during this period. And you were to find out that the girl was pregnant, that you had betrothed. And, oh, by the way, Joseph, it says, was a righteous man, right? Righteous means he did what was right in God's standing. So did jo Joseph knew, if no one else knew, Joseph knew he did not sleep with her. Even if everyone else might have thought he did because Mary now was found to be with child, Joseph's like, I didn't do it. And in, is it this, I don't know about you, but I find this, this is the intro to the birth of Jesus. I mean, besides his genealogy proving his lineage, to all those forefathers that got that same promise repeated to them, this is the guy who God chose to play dad on earth. Not heavenly father, but earthly father to the son of God. And to show his righteousness, this guy, this would be like, okay, if I was betrothed, Jan and I dated three and a half years. Four and a half. Time for, no, you're right, four and a half. Don't ever do that, it's way too long. <laughs> Just saying. And we didn't sleep together, by God's grace. It's a miracle. If someone says, prove there's a God, I, that's my proof, okay? Because she's really cute. And uh, if, she had, if she had all of a sudden came and told me, oh, honey, I'm, I'm pregnant. I'd be like, uh, <laughs> well, I know it wasn't me. Okay, and if you did that while we were, you know, in our courtship, quote, loosely betrothal period, I didn't have to pay, you know, like, like they did in the Jewish culture, but, but um, you know, we were pretty much fixed on getting married and if you would have told, we were, officially we got engaged on New Year's Eve. I, I thought, you know, New Year's Eve is always one of those, the world's partying about something. I want something really to party about. I'm going to ask Jen to marry me on New Year's Eve. That way I could just say those fireworks are for us, you know. And that's our, that's our party to celebrate when, when I asked you to marry me. And so, so uh, I, I, I like, if I would have found out after New Year's Eve in that last, we got married in September. If I had found out somewhere between New Year's Eve and September that Jan said during the time when we were we were officially engaged, we'd give her the ring and everything, and I would she would have come to me and said, "I'm pregnant." I first want to kill somebody, not her, but maybe a guy somewhere. I'd it's Italian part of me would come out, and I'd be like, "Where is he? Who did this to you? You know?" Because I would I, I'm just sorry, but you know, it's a part of the way I'm wired. I would have just said, "I'm taking this guy out, whoever he is." Now, Joseph knew the Jewish law, and if the girl was found to be with child, and Joseph, knowing he didn't 
fool around with Mary and it wasn't his baby. Joseph knew what the law state. What did the law state what happened to that woman for, for being unfaithful during her betrothal period? Do you guys know it's very strict? Stoned. She'd be stoned. They would stone her to death. There was, when it came to no hanky-panky rule, they had it down. This is like, you don't, you don't cross this line. You wait till you're, no put in the cart before the horse. You wait till you're married. And then you can be together, but not before. Now Joseph, it says, being a righteous man, listen to this. Verse 19 says, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous. Now you say, why does it say her husband, even though he's not, you know, they haven't had the wedding day? Because that's how serious they call betrothal. You get to wear the title of husband without the benefits. All the responsibilities, but you got to wait for the week of the wedding, you know, after the ceremony. That's when you get to have the perks. But until then, you get to man up. And it says here, he's already considered her husband in the Jewish culture because he's betrothed to her. And it says, and being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, he could have he could have just brought it out to the public attention and said, hey, everybody, you know, I didn't do this. And someone else did this, you know, and and you get the real religious snooty snoots involved and they would have taken her out and stoned her to death. But Joseph, not wanting to disgrace Mary, it says he desired to put her away secretly. Let's send her away so she doesn't get in trouble. Now we have a helicopter. Woohoo! I'm pausing so they can edit this out. Jesus didn't have those during his sermons either. He came, someone said, why didn't he come at our time? It's too many interruptions. You know, back in his day, they didn't, planes, no planes flying over, nothing. They just sat there and listened to him. Now let's go on here. It says, then it says, Joseph, when he had considered this, verse 20, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why? For that which is within her, she's been, she, it has been conceived, it is from the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a man that did this to, to, to your... And, and by the way, Mary would be called his wife during the betrothal period. It's not a man, a man that did this, Joseph. It's the Holy Ghost. And when we read the Gospel, Luke says the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she became with child. Some people say, well, I don't know if I believe in that immaculate conception. Is it really hard for God to make Mary be with child when you're the creator of the universe? Do you go, oh, this is a tough one today. I'm really going to have to work hard at this. I mean, come on. This is nothing for the Lord. I mean, if you, if you have trouble with this, you're probably going to have trouble with the rest of this book. Because this book is filled with God's power and, and handiwork. And personally, I like that God can do all these miracles. It makes me, makes me have confidence that I'm not serving some schmuck that has no power. And, and you know, you, those of you that have studied other religions, you, you find out sometimes the leaders of these religions are really creeps. And they want people to bow down and do all this stuff to them. And, and they don't have any power to help them. And they don't have any mercy or grace or, or love like we read about the Lord of the Bible. Well, here, the Lord tells Joseph with an angel. An angel's got to visit him in a dream. Now, someone asked me the other day, how, how does God talk to us? I'm like, he's got, a, he's got a multitude of ways. He can, I say sometimes you got to wait till I'm asleep because I, I tend to, maybe move around too much in the day. So the Lord goes, I'm going to wait till he's, you know, run out of energy and falls down. And then when I'm there, he goes, ah, he's holding still. Now I'll talk to him. And Joseph, he waited till he was asleep and sent a, an angel to speak to him in a dream. Now, can an angel appear to someone in a dream? Remember in the Old Testament, did that ever happen? Yeah. Read the book of Daniel. You'll see some really cool ways that the Lord spoke to people. And he, he, could, he could speak to you. He could 
he could send you a prophet like they did in, in the Bible days. Isaiah, the prophet, the Lord would speak to him and send him to go speak to the king. To Hezekiah, he would speak things of the Lord to him. The Lord, thus says the Lord. That's always the line the prophets lead out with. It's not thus says the prophet, by the way. You don't need a prophet who's going to tell you what they think. You need a prophet that tells you what the Lord thinks. Now here, this angel comes to Joseph, and I'm sure you guys have heard this story, but he comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, I know you're, you're considering putting her away. He was, gonna, he, was, he was such a righteous guy. He's like, I don't want her to, to be stoned to death. But I know it's not my child, so let's just put her away, send her away secretly, and you know, at least she'll stay alive. But the angel said, this child, verse 21, that she shall bear will be a son. And you will call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their what? Their sins. His name is Jesus. Now, we, Jesus, by the way, is the English pronunciation. His name is, in, in Hebrew, is Yehovah Shua, or contracted down as Yahshua. In English, they, they pronounce it Joshua. Anyone know someone named Joshua or Josh? That's from the Hebrew. Yahshua is Yah for Yahweh, the, the name of the Lord. And Shua in Hebrew is salvation. The Lord's salvation is what, what Jesus' name means. The Lord's salvation. Someone says, what's your name? Can you imagine when he was little? He's on the playground. They say, what's your name? The Lord's salvation. Really, come on, quit clowning with us. What, what, what's really your name? Um, the Lord's salvation. Do you, th uh, you think that that was another cryptic clue? Who are you? God's salvation. I mean, and uh, where were you born? In the house of bread? And what was that moniker they gave you? The bread of what? Of life? Oh yeah, bread of life, born at the house of bread. Just happens to be called by translation of his name, God's salvation. The Lord's, that, that's how we say it. It's literally the Lord's salvation salvation the angel told Joseph Mary is going to have a son this is before ultrasounds before you know any of the way that they I mean how do you know it was going to be a boy 50-50 no 100-100 he's an angel sent from the Lord I'm telling you that which is within her came from the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost of the Most High from God that's not from a man don't worry and I mean I don't know about you but if I was Joseph I'd be thinking um could you repeat that again just to make I want to make sure I heard what you said and he says and that that is within her that boy is going to be called the Lord's salvation for he will save his people from their sins here comes the Savior. Now it says, all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin shall be with child. Isaiah, this is Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 7. About in the middle there, around 14, 15. It says, the, the, the virgin shall be with child. I don't know if you guys know that passage. It's a beautiful passage. It's, it's one where the Lord... Let me just turn there real quick. I, I didn't plan on this, so give me a second here. In Isaiah chapter 7, the, the prophet is um, speaking to the king, and he's like telling him something that he's going to do. And, and, he, and, you know, as men do, we kind of wonder, uh, how, God, how do I know you're really telling me what, what's going to happen is true? You know, like, how, how do I know I can bank on this? And the Lord told through the prophet, told the king, just pick a sign, any sign. He goes, no, no, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to, like, test God or anything. He said, no, no, pick, go ahead. Now, if God said that to you, how would you feel? Pick a sign. I'd be like, hmm, let's see, could you make a million dollars show up in my bank account, you know? <laughs> or, I don't know about it, I'm just saying, pick a sign, any sign. Well, here's, he goes, I'm not going to do that. He says, well, then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, 
And he said, a ask yourself a sign from the Lord God. In verse, I'm sorry, Isaiah 7, 10. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as shoal or as high as heaven, as the depths of, the, of, uh, of shoal or the highest heaven. Pick a sign of anything. And Ahaz says, I, I won't ask or test the Lord. And he said, listen now then, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you would try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, since you won't pick a sign, the prophet says, since you won't pick a sign, the Lord's going to pick a sign for you. Okay? And what sign did he pick? He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you this as a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and shall bear a son and she will call his name, what? Emmanuel, God with us. And he will eat curds of honey at time he knows, at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. The, the, the King Ahaz was afraid of these other kingdoms taking over. And he says, listen, by the time this kid rises up, the, the ones you're worrying about, they'll be, th those kingdoms will have been gone. Now, guess what? The king, you, if you want to do your little extra credit homework, read about the kingdoms that Ahaz was facing and try to find them today. Try to even find them on a map in the days of Jesus. Because guess what? From the days of Isaiah till the time the Lord comes, they get erased. They're gone off the map. Yet he was so fearful of them. Oh, no, oh, no, God, I don't know. And the Lord says, look, I'm looking out for you. You want proof? Ask me a sign. I, I, I'm not going to do that, Ahaz says. He says, all right, I'll give you a sign. But this sign that the, that the Lord gave, talk about a sign. You got a virgin who has never had sex. That's technically right, the definition. She's never known any intimate relations with a, with a man, and yet, he says, she'll be with child. Here's the miracle. I'll give you a sign. Why does the New Testament lead off with that, do you think? This story about Mary not having had relations with Joseph, but yet she's with, she's with child? Because it's the fulfillment. In order that this verse would be... Now, to you as a Gentile, you, you know, I don't know about you, but like, okay, great. What's the big deal? But if you're Jewish, is the prophet Isaiah a big, you know, kind of to-do guy in, the, in, their, in their who's who of their, you know, spiritual roster? Yeah. He's like, he's on the, he's on the, he, well, he's cool in the category what they call the major prophets. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. These guys are lumped into their scriptures in one grouping. They have the major prophets. They, they have the minor prophets, the little, you know, just short little books what end our, our scriptures. We have 10 of the minor prophets collected at the, you know, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Habakkuk, Nahum, those guys. They're all from near the end of our uh, Old Testament. But Isaiah, he's the big guy in the Jewish prophet world. I mean, he's big. And they know... The book I say. Why do they know that book so well? Do you think? Those of you that don't know Jewish culture, this one's really easy. If you wanna, if you wanna have a title called Pharisee of Pharisees, there's one guy we have in the New Testament has actually had that moniker. Does anyone remember his name? Saul. He got his name changed to what? Paul. And to get the moniker Pharisee of Pharisees, first you had to study to become a Pharisee. Then you had to do more studies. So we, we'd say like. First, you have to go get your, your graduate degree, your undergrad degree. Then you have to go to graduate school. Then you've got to go to a doctorate, okay? To get to be a Pharisee of Pharisees is kind of like getting your doctorate in theology. But as part of your doctorate in theology, back in their day, they didn't have copy machines. So guess what? You had to write out by hand. Every jot, every tittle, that's what well, we'd say, every, uh, every vowel, every consonant, Every inflection in Hebrew, we actually, there's little ways that you can put emphasis on certain parts of the words and, 
and pronunciations for each letter. And so depending on, you know, hard C sound or soft, you know, you put these little teeny tittles, they're called. They're, they look like little apostrophes, little, tiny apostrophes, little t That's a tittle. T -t -t -t. And, and you put those, and if you wanted the title Pharisee of Pharisee, guess which book you had to write out by hand and memorize? Isaiah, the whole scroll. This, yeah, 66 chapters in our Bible. It's, it's broke. They didn't have chapter distinctions back then, by guys. They just had one long, continuous scroll of Isaiah. And you had to know the whole thing. And you were tested on it. And you had to have your own personal copy with no mistakes. If you got almost to the end and you messed up one letter, guess what you got to do? Tear it up and start over. Now, Paul says he had this title, Pharisee of Pharisees. But to someone who's a Jew, who reads, you know, when you're just trying to share with your Jewish friend, you wonder, what's the big deal? Why does the New Testament start with the Gospel of Matthew? And it sounds kind of like a Jewish slanted book. It's because these guys are waiting for a promise that God repeated over and over and over. And Matthew says, and here it is, the fulfillment of the promise. Is it good to have a promise fulfilled? You know, when God... I don't know about you, but even as parents, if we make a promise to our kids, by the way, if you make one, you better keep it. The Bible says, let your yes be yes, your no be no, and anything besides that is what? Evil. But when you make a promise, or someone makes, how about when someone makes a promise to you, and then they come through? How do you feel? You know, when they, when they deliver what they promised. I mean, if, if it's something they promise that's really big. Hey, look, I'm going to be bringing, I got a present for you. And um, I want to bless you. I, I have this new car and we're leaving the island, so I'm going to give it to you. I'll be over. Right before we leave, I'm going to drop it off. Could you just run me to the airport and it's yours? Now, someone did that to you. This is like the most planes we've ever had. No, a helicopter again. Sorry. If someone did that to you, they made you a promise that we're giving you this thing. If you're like me and you've been in the ministry a while, you probably are going, yeah, right. We'll wait till the day. In fact, I think I'll wait to believe it till the day after you leave to see if I actually have the keys and the cars parked in my driveway. Because I, I hear a lot of promises without fulfillment of those promises. As anyone can give an amen to that, you've had this happen to you. Someone deliver, they promise a great thing for you. We're going to give you this, we promise. And you keep waiting. And you keep waiting, and pretty soon you're just like, like, it's like the Bible says hope deferred makes your heart what? Sick. Man, when, you, when you're waiting for a promise and they don't come through, you get sick to your heart inside. Just like, ah. <sighs> And by the way, that's what you do to your children if you promise them something and don't deliver. They feel like their heart just grows sick. It's like mom and dad say they will, but they don't. Don't do it. Better to not promise than to promise and not pay. Okay, if you, th this is from the book of Ecclesiastes, actually. It says, if you make a vow, make sure you pay what you vow. Don't vow and not pay. It says, God takes no delight in fools. You need to vow what you pay. Now, I know that's a really interesting Christmas message, right? But, you know, there are people at Christmas time making a lot of vows that they're going to, I promise I'm going to do this, I promise that, and they don't keep their promises. And that should not be the type of people we are. We should say, if we say it, we do it. I, I'm, I use my grandfather often for some of my analogies at church because my grandfather was not a real vocal person about his faith. But his approach was you have to walk the walk before you can talk the talk. You have to show what you believe. You have to, do, you have to live it. And when it came to giving his word, there was never, ever in my entire life a time that someone came and said, your grandfather gave his word that he'd be there on the job site to help me, he was a master tile setter, that he was going to come and work on this 
you know, bathroom for me or whatever, or, or the kitchen and do the time. There was not one time that someone said, he, he told me he'd be there and he wasn't there. He broke his promise. He, he, he didn't fulfill his word. Because my grandfather, if he said he'd be there, I mean, basically it'd take death to keep him from being where he said he'd be. He'd have to have died. It just, he was a person of his word. Now, does that give me stability when you grow up with a man like that in your life? That when he says yes, it's yes, and when he says no, it's no. You bet you it did. And I'm only saying this because some of you guys, the younger ones here, you're, 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 it's your turn to be the dad. And if you want to make a great Christmas for your kid, be a person who fulfills your word. If you say yes, you, f you keep it. Is it okay to say no? My grandfather, if he said no, I knew don't bug him again. You, it, <laughs> the kids today, if you say no to them, they think it means just keep trying. <laughs> and uh, sometimes my most persistent child will ask me over and over and over when I say no. I'm not telling you which one, but you have to guess. Raquel. Raquel. <coughs> and, and you say no, and she just thinks it means let me just wheedle him a little more. I'll just keep working over dad, you know. But the Bible says if you say no and you change that to yes, that that's, that's evil, just as evil as saying yes and not delivering, like delivering a no. You need to let your yes be yes. And by the way, who said this? Let your yes be yes, your no be no? James. Jesus. Right? And James quotes it to us. Right? And anything besides this is evil. Just say what you mean and fulfill it. Now this, what we studied this morning from Matthew's gospel, this is God fulfilling his promise. Is it a big deal? In the spiritual realm, you know, in the broad storyline of redemption, of God saving the world? Oh yeah, this is like the ultimate big promise coming through the pipe right here. This is the promise he made over, repeated over and over. He, he said, I made it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, or Israel, he gets his name changed to Israel, we say in English, to Israel, and then to, down to his son, to Judah, and, and to David, and he repeated this promise because he didn't want them to miss out. And then, here, what we looked at in Isaiah, even to the king, Ahaz, look, I'm going to make sure you know it's me. I'm going to make a virgin to bear a son. And you will call him, what? Emmanuel, God with us. When Jesus was on the earth, he will, when he's older, he'll, they'll say to him, his own disciples, just show us the Father, it'll suffice. And his answer will be, have I been with you so long a time? If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. I came to show you the Father. That's what I came for. And he goes in the, in the Pharisees. They, they take you know, this kind of same thing. And he tells them, listen, guys. They, they're like saying, show us God. And he says, listen, I'm, I'm here. I am. Before Abraham was, he said, I am. When he said that, they took up stones to stone and they said, you're, you're calling yourself God. If they would have paid attention to what his name translation was, <laughs> Emmanuel, it's a little hint. Somebody should have been reading their book of Isaiah. God with us. He is God with us. And that's such an important thing that we remember at this time of year. We remember Jesus came to be God with us. You know, you might have friends that have an objection to your faith. They're like, you Christians, you're just a bunch of weak wussies. You, you know, you, you're always needing a crutch. That, that, that religious stuff, that's just your crutch. I say, listen, a dead man doesn't need a crutch. Because the Bible says before I was, before I was a, a follower of Jesus, I was dead in my trespasses. Christ came in and caused me to be born again, anew in the spirit. I have newness of life now because of Jesus. Dead men don't need crutches. They need a stretcher. They need someone to drag the stretcher over to the guy who can resurrect them.
And that's the guy I'm telling you about. Jesus is not a crutch. Jesus is the one that gives us life everlasting. And he came to forgive us of our sins. And what a glorious thing we get to share. But you have friends that might be saying, you're just a wimp. And you believe this stuff. And, 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 and why, why do you guys, what's the big deal? The big deal is, do we need our sins forgiven? Yeah. And Jesus came. Joseph was told. Now, how would you like to be Joseph? All of a sudden you realize, my wife, my betrothed woman here, my wife, Mary, who I haven't had relations with, is going to have a boy. And that boy is the Son of God. And I get to raise him. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> right? Oh my, he's, but it says Joseph did as he was commanded. Talk about a righteous guy. He listened to that angel. He got up and did what God told him. To. I, my, I, my, I salute Joseph. I think he's an awesome guy in the Bible. Because he, he took that responsibility and he, it says he kept her a virgin. I want to point this out, verse 25. We'll end with this today. He kept her a virgin, it says, until she gave birth to a son. And he called her name, or his, sorry, he called his name Jesus. Now, if you want to read in Mark's gospel, chapter uh, 6, verse 3. Jesus had um, half-brothers and, and sisters, half-sisters. I say half because they're actually going to be kids that were born from Joseph having relations with Mary. Being raised Catholic, by the way, we were taught the perpetual virginity of Mary. That she only had one child, never had sex ever before or after. And I was like, wait a minute, because... I, I have my Catholic Bible. Do, do you know what's so weird? Is I was taught that as a kid in catechism. And I get my little New English, the way it was called, the Bible, my Catholic translation. It had little stick figures in it, and I always liked the pictures. They weren't very good, but, but I, 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 you know, Jesus at the Last Supper, this little stick men sitting around at a table, and uh, I still can see it in my mind. But I also remember that in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, it says that even his own brothers and sisters did not believe him. That they mocked him. They said, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you go up and show yourself to the, you know, the public. Announce yourself. When, this is when they're older. And they actually kind of took jabs at their own brother. And by the way, if you didn't know this, well, just look there. I'll end with this. Mark 6 Verse 3 says the names. This is interesting. It says, is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary? This is what the guys were saying about Jesus when he was preaching as an adult. And is not his brother, um, the bro isn't he the brother of James and of Joseph and of Judas and of Simon? He has four brothers named right there. And are these not his sisters? plural, sisters, that we have here with us? Now, it doesn't say their names or how many, but I know he, sisters means at least how many? Two. I'm the oldest of six in my family. We have four boys, two girls. I used to be jealous of Jesus. I used to think, lucky duck, he's an only child. You know those only childs, they get everything. When you're in a big family, you've got to share. And the bummer is, when you're the oldest but you don't grow fast, you have the weirdest situation ever. My younger brother, whose name was Joseph, after this guy we're studying today, he sprouted up taller than me. When we, from about junior high on, my younger brother, it was me, then Ursula, then Joseph, all of a sudden, who's, you know, two kids down the line, is now taller than me. And guess who has to wear his hand-me-downs? I mean, no, hand-me-ups. I had hand-me-up jeans for my little brother. Talk about embarrassing. And I used to think, it's not, Jesus, you don't know the pain of hand-me-ups. Because you, you're an only child. You're like so spoiled. That's Okay, come on. If you were taught he was, Mary was a virgin before, 
and was kept a virgin after, right? Even though your Catholic Bible, by the way, you can go, if you go, some of you might have an old Catholic Bible laying around. Just look at Mark 6, 3 and notice they did not take this verse out. The priest who was teaching me, no, it was actually the nun. She didn't read the book. I'm, I'm laughing going, wait a minute. It says the names right here. And all of a sudden for me, I got great comfort because it names four four guys and sisters plural so at least two so he's like the oldest of seven minimum there might have been more girls and all of a sudden my whole perspective just i was like man jesus you're a lot more relatable now <laughs> well i can relate because have any of you been in a in a situation with half brothers and sisters you know where same mom different dad my mom got married and divorced five times. I didn't have the, the half brother situation. I had the, f the their kids from from, from the dad side with our kids from my mom's side, and at one time, I went from the oldest of six to where, my mom married this guy Art, and he had five kids. They were all older than me, so I went from the oldest of six to the middle of, eleven, five older brothers and sisters, five younger. Talk about, that is not an adjustment you can make well. Or I didn't, anyway. You, it, it's weird. And I used to cry out, Jesus, you don't know what it's like to have to, to eat as fast as you can because the rule was you only get one piece of food each and whoever finishes their food first could go back for that last piece of chicken. But when you got 13 people at a table and only one chicken leg waiting, you got to eat fast. It took me years to slow down after that. Because I got so conditioned during my high school. If y'all wanted seconds, man, I had, to, I had to have my plate polished before we were allowed to stick our fork back for that last piece. And boy, did I, I mean, I inhaled food. Just, <laughs> just to get that piece. And, it's, and I used to cry out, God, you're not fair. You, have, you know, why couldn't I have been born like into your family with one kid? That would have been a lot better. And then I read in the scriptures, Jesus wasn't the only one. He had four half-brothers. I say half because he, same mom, different dad. Joseph was the father of those other guys. And whose was Jesus' father? God. And they even mocked his own brother, said, and if God is your father, you know, can, do, do siblings know how to, Dig, yeah, that's the right word. Yeah, dig it to the, you know, put the, the knife to them, you know. If God is your dad, why don't you, you know, yeah, we heard the stories. Why don't you go up and show yourself if God is your dad? And they did that to him. Cruel, huh? Until later. Till later. Do you guys know that it wasn't until after Jesus died and rose from the dead that they came to, to believe that he truly was the Messiah. They had to see it unfold before they believed. And sometimes we do too. Sometimes we need to see God deliver on his promises and pull off some miracle and then all of a sudden something, the light goes on for us. Now you might have friends that the light hasn't come on yet for them. Be patient. You know, if I could tell you anything that could help their faith is you being patient. You know, how, mu how much patience did God have with Israel? How much patience has he had with us? Should we have patience with others? You know, let's make this a great Christmas time this year. Let's make this the best. Let's be people that we keep our word. Yes is yes, no is no. Anything else, evil. And let's have some patience. With, with folks as God is working to turn that light on for them and illuminate their path. Because Jesus, another thing he was called was the light of the world. And he says, he comes into us. He says, now, he didn't come into us so that we would take our lamp and put a bushel over it or hide it under a bed. Where do we put our lamp? 
up on the lampstand where it shines bright and illuminates. So may the Lord shine brightly through you this week so that people around you go, wow, look at that girl. That, that girl, she's glowy. You know? That she, She's got like, there's a light. There's a, there's a, there's a, do people see that in us when we, when we shine for the Lord? Yeah. And if you haven't heard that compliment, I say it's a compliment because it really is spiritually. When someone comes up to you and says, wow, you have like this, this glow to you, this, uh, oh, what's the new age thing? The aura. You have a golden aura. <laughs> I hear that in the store sometimes. I laugh. I go, I know, thank you. You know what that is? It's Jesus. Jesus is in my heart. And what you get to that, that light you're perceiving, you must be, you must be spiritually sensitive. Did, have you heard about Jesus? Do you know it's a great opportunity to share what that light is that they're seeing? Tell them. Jesus came to light the whole world. And if you're a little nervous and you think, I can't do it, just bring him here next week. Aaron's going to preach for me. I'm going to be on the mainland preaching. And he's going to preach for me, and I want you to support him. And, and he's going to share about the story of Ruth and the Redeemer. I, I don't know if you guys know the story of Ruth. If you don't, read ahead. Uh, no, I'm not spoiling it. Sorry, Aaron. No spoiler on this one. But I know this story. It's a good story. Come out next week and hear the, the, the story of Ruth and, and, and how Christ is our Redeemer. It's another one of these beautiful promises fulfilled. And I just want you to enjoy that this week as we, uh, you know, as we're going to end the year. This is going to be, next week is the last Sunday of this 2015. When I see you next time, I'll be, I, I get to say to you today, see you next year. You know, next year we'll be back and uh, Lord willing and we'll be, you know, doing this. Now for you guys that, that are one of those tech savvy ones, you can go on the on YouTube, and you can even look up Calvary Tri City. That's the church that sent me out. I'll be back there, and John Higgins is doing an end times update. Always at the end of the year, he he's really gifted with prophetic. Under like he can't watch the news without going. That's a Isaiah twenty three six, and that's a you know that's Ezekiel. And I used to take notes every time we watch the news. And then on a commercial, I'd be like, what does Isaiah 23, 6 uh, mean? And how does it go with the story? And I got the best Bible studies just watching the news with him. Because he, so, he knows the word so good that when it happens in the world, he's like, that's, the, that's scripture being fulfilled right now. And man, it was so cool. It's like, the word of God is alive. I mean, it's like happening. And he's going to do an end times update. And he asked me if I you know, would chime in with him and do. So So they film their stuff too. And I'll try to find out how to get our stuff linked to theirs because we're all new to the YouTube. And thanks to everyone who subscribed. We got um, 72 subscribers in three weeks, which is big for a, a puny church. So thanks thanks to the Lord. And, uh, and, and we got 980 views on YouTube. So almost 1,000 last night when I checked of the, of the things. And on Facebook... It, it counts only from my church page, but it says we had over 2,600 people watch the sermon from three weeks ago about love one another, which is just blows my brains, you know, like, whoa. But it's cool because people are tuning in. So if you have friends that couldn't make it or you want to share with them what we get to enjoy, um, go friend us on, friend my wife. She's the best of the Facebook. Friend Janet Manzo on Facebook, and she'll bounce you the the link, and uh, and you know let you know where it is, and w and we'll and we'll uh, let you get encouraged with the word. And this, what you got to hear today, if you know somebody, who, you're going, man, I wish my friend might maybe might, maybe have a Jewish friend who wouldn't go to church, but you can maybe get them to listen to it on a computer, or on their iPhone or whatever. Just ask them, say, hey, just check this out on YouTube. Words of Aloha is the name of our thing. Words of Aloha. And, uh, and we're right at the top of the search engine now because all those people have been watching. And so and when, we, when I typed in words of Aloha three weeks ago, it was Brother Is, the, the Hawaiian singer. <laughs> and then a bunch of other Hawaiian sh you know, videos. Now it's us for like the first six sermons are listed and then Brother Is. And I'm like, woo! I mean, I know Brother, oh well, he's in heaven now, but I knew him when he was here. 
And I'm just like, Lord, you are so cool that the word's getting out. So tell your friends, look at Words of Aloha on YouTube or go to AmazingGraceKona.com and there's a link right on the front page. It'll take you right to our Facebook. It'll take you also right to the YouTube if you want and you can, uh, and you just click it and it'll jump you there. Tell your friend, go check this out. Hear about Jesus fulfilling. God kept his word. And it's good for our heart when we know God keeps his word. Gives us stability in our faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege to share these sweet truths of what you have accomplished for us. Lord, thanks for being the God that has fulfilled every promise you have made. Lord, you, you've you kept. And the ones that you have yet to, to have unfold for us, Lord, we, we know you're, a, you're the God that keeps your word. So we're looking forward to to you sending your son back. And as John closed the New Testament and said, prayed, even Lord Jesus, come quickly. So we pray that same thing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And as he closed with, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May his grace be with each person. We pray it now in Jesus' name. And there when the greed said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Listening to Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.